what went down. Okay, so yes, correct. The other time he visited the hub. No, no, you were right. You were oh, right. When they were cleaning the mm -hmm, house, mm -hmm. and they were all one to one in the house for the reservoir. Do you remember who was cleaning and who? No, I think they were calling him, but man, who's Martha? So Martha, Martha was getting busy about like, oh, I gotta get the house clean. It's like Sabbath. I gotta get the Windex. I gotta. Oh, ch -ch I need to look who looks like, was that personal for anyone? Um, <laughs> but Mary, she's the one who sat at the feet of Jesus, and he says later on, he's like, like when Martha busts in, she's like, can't you see that we need to get things in order? Da -da -da. And Jesus says, like, Martha, chillax. That's what he actually said. Like um, but he's like, Mary's chosen like the right thing to just be still for a moment, let the house be dirty, and be refreshed by me. So it's like, how often am I doing that daily? And this is preaching to myself because I can easily like be coasting on spiritual fumes for a week of like not having had like true God time where I just kind of drop everything and say, here's what I'm grappling with, Lord. What are you, where are you leading at? I'm just like, okay, God, I'll handle that in stride. Because we live in a very um, grind culture of like, I just need to figure it out. And if God wants to intervene, I guess that's cool. But it's like, no, I need to let, invite God intentionally to be in this space and be okay with him maybe not working on my timetable. Ooh, that's a scary thought. So habit number two is imitate, don't emulate. Does anybody know, like, if we uh, go back to our Oxford dictionaries, does anybody know what the difference between imitating and emulating is? It's a very subtle one. So, so when you imitate someone, you're doing exactly what they're, what they're doing. Uh -huh. Kind of. Emulate, it's like imitation, but with the purpose of blowing past them. It's like, I want to imitate you so I can be better than you. So it's kind of, there's like a, kind of like a dark edge to it. So in imitation, you can learn and then be like, oh, okay, that's an interesting way of doing that painting. Um, I'm gonna glean, I'm gonna like borrow your color palette, but I'm not gonna take your whole practice over to what I'm doing. When you emulate, you're like, yeah, I'm gonna take your art and I'm gonna make it better. And it's like a very angsty, it's, it's a weird space. So it's great to have like inspiration from other content creators. Like if you find somebody like, are any of you familiar with the Chai Guy? Cross culture Kev? Yeah. He, he makes chai um, and he has like life musings and he's a, he's a pastor in the Adventist church. Um, but he like went viral during the pandemic and he was here last year. And so he um, would talk a little bit about like just comparison with other content creators. And it's like, there's this driver that's like, I see what that person is doing. I want to do exactly what they're doing. And it's like, you want to you know, have that space to talk about God, but do you necessarily have to do it exactly like they're doing? Does that come naturally to you? Is that the way God is calling you to speak? Or do you have a different flavor that you can speak to people that, you know, this person over here isn't using? Um, so like when we force ourselves to, and we're, when we're fueled by comparison, we force ourselves to adopt voices that aren't our own. And when it's an inauthentic voice, it's not sustainable for you. Eventually you have like a imposter syndrome of like, this isn't what I wanted, and the, you know, all that good tears flow. And, all that good stuff. So you can glean insights and production values from other content creators, but don't feel like you have to be someone that you are not. So habit number three. This is a weird one to say, so kind of like look at it, and then it's um, think kin kin, not win win. I will unpack what the heck that means. <laughs> so kin that. Do y'all know what the word kin means? Mm -hmm. It's not a word we use too often in our everyday vernacular, but family. So kin is anybody who's your family. So 
I'm kind of riffing off of a book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Sean Covey, if you've ever heard of it. And it has really good principles, seven really good principles. One of them is um, think win-win, which means everybody gains something from coming together. I'm not totally bashing that habit at all, but I think when you are more kin-kin, like family-minded, seeing everybody you pass on the street as they are also a son or a daughter of God, you are that much more invested in wanting to communicate his love to them. So it like kind of like transcends the win-win of like, yeah, we both get a piece of the pie. It's like, we both get pie and ice cream. Oh yeah, this is gonna be good. Unless you're lactose intolerant, then we'll find you a suitable yeah. replacement. I got you, I got you. <laughs> I sensed it. All right. So habit number four. Um, begin with thy will, not my will. So this is the this is where the rubber meets the road, and it, it gets uncomfortable for us because it's about surrender to like where God wants to lead your content creation. And sometimes he's going to impress you through the spirit to speak on something that might be very personal to you. Something you may have like never shared with, like if you go to therapy, you might not have even shared it with a therapist or your closest friend or family member. But you get this like inkling of like, somebody out there, this is really gonna resonate with them and bring them closer to God than like, the deepest sermon could, but you're fighting it because you're like, but oh, what are people going to think of me? You're fighting the beast of perception. And so I really think it's important. This kind of links really well with like be when you're being still, then it's easy to begin with thy will and not my will because you're saying, Lord, here's the way that I think we could do this. And you like roll up to the meeting with God and you're like, <coughs> I, here's my portfolio. I think we should go with option A. That's looking really great to me. And God is like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We can use this part of it, but we're, we're doing option omega. And you're like, oh, oh, oh. okay then. So um, just kind of, it's, it's so oxymoronic, but getting comfortable with discomfort because you're gonna grapple with uncertainty when you're working with God. The one certainty you have is that he is for you, but the ways that that comes through, sometimes it does not reconcile with our human way of like, this is how God's provision should be. He's like, I'm gonna provide for you, but not in the way that you want. What you want is not what you need spiritually, and it's not what others in proximity to you need. So, moving on, habit number five. This isn't at all sponsored by Taylor Swift. I just used the verb. So, be swift to hear. So, since it's the Sabbath day, we're gonna, we're gonna flip open our, our Bibles or our, our digital Bibles real quick. So, can somebody read for me James 1, verses 19 and 20? Whoever gets there first. We're doing digital Bible swords. Uh, 1, 19, and 20. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be listening to the quick lesson, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. So, the first part of that, um, I've, I've had this one doled out at me when I was like, check yourself, especially in a Jamaican household. <laughs> But I really like the first part of it because it's all about active listening. So there's passive listening and there's active listening. Passive listening, I think most of us have um, either practiced or <coughs> experienced at some point. It's like we do it when you know we're really in a hurry to get somewhere and then you run into somebody like Publix and they are telling you every detail of, your li of their life. And you're like, mm-hmm. Uh huh. Oh, well, it's but mm hmm, mm hmm, and you're like trying to get out of there. It's kind of like passive listening. You're not really sitting with what they're communicating, and it seems like they have a lot on their heart they want to share. But you're just like, oh, this timing is not opportune. 
And then we kind of like, have you ever been the recipients of like when you could sense like you really wanted to, kind of, like somebody asked you who you or how you were at church, and you're you're you don't have the energy and. You, First of all, you shouldn't be fronting at church. Like, if you're not, if you had a bad week, like, you should be feel safe enough at, with your church to be able to be like, that was a rough one. Mm -hmm. And then, like, if the person's like, oh, what's up? Like, and you really feel like I can trust this person, I can unload. Hopefully, they are actively listening. And then, like, the the most awesome response is like, you share, and they're like, can I just pray with you right now? And you're like, oh, yes, let's go. Um, but like when you sense that you're being passively listened to, it's like, okay, I, I want to detach from this conversation because I see you don't have like my interests at heart. Mm -hmm. So um, especially when it comes to creating content, like sometimes like you have to get a few pieces out there as you're <coughs> like honing in on who your target demographic is that you're speaking to. Is it fellow mothers of, you know, children with autism is that you, you can get very niche with your audiences but if you try to reach everyone you're not going to reach anyone it's it's too broad and like especially with like getting into the the algorithm side of things it doesn't know who to send your content to who it would benefit so be an active listener as you're starting out on your digital missionary journey so that like as you get comments and something's like oh that really hit with me or I need you to unpack this more. You can learn more about who is kind of, you know, giving you the time of day. They're kind of wanting to hear more about what you're saying, but they're not fully understanding it. So you can start to create content that's, you know, hopefully it's in line with the people that you're trying to, it's in the neighborhood of the people you're trying to reach. And then you can um, fine tune it more to address the issues that you, as well as they are grappling with. So. On to habit number six, which is empathize. What a fun verb that is. Can anybody like tell me what is your understanding of what it means to have empathy or to empathize for somebody? To have compassion or show compassion. To have compassion or show compassion. Any Put yourself in their shoes. Uh-huh. Put their self, yourself in their shoes. Remember when you used to be in that situation or something. Mm -hmm. mm. Love the person. So what's that other, um, it's an adage that's related, it's like, walk a mile in somebody else's shoes. Uh -huh. It's kind of like that same thing. And then let me know if you're going to make it with how I And then let me know how, like, how the blisters uh -huh. are doing. It's like, aha, that's why I'm so cranky. Now yeah. you get it. <laughs> um, so empathizing kind of, it ties really well with the previous one of once you can fine tool your content, you start to become a lot more aware of like, oh, I can see how that would really upset you. How, like shame is a triggering event for you, how such and such really makes you anxious and how you don't know how to cope with that anxiety. Um, if you can't empathize with your targeted audience, they will pick up on that and feel that they are being preached at. And the last thing you want to do, I think the last thing any of us enjoy is being preached at. It's like, you know, you're a sinner too. It's like, you're I don't know you, you're a thousand miles away and you don't know me, you don't know me. So you don't want to be, um, you don't want to be the preacher. You want to be somebody who can just share, like, as I'm doing life alongside you, here's a tip or here's an insight that I gleaned. What do you think of that? You're inviting them to the table for a conversation, exchange of ideas, and then they'll be more, you know, likely to engage in a positive. Um, productive discourse with you. It doesn't immediately turn into, from my point of view, you're evil. And it's like, oh, okay, well, this has been great. <laughs> so in order to maximize your engagement on a spiritual and creative level, you have to level and trust them by authentically seeking their good, not good views. And that's a tough one to separate because so many times, like, I'm guilty of this. Like, I'll throw a piece of content up and then, like, 10 minutes later, I'm like, And then, like, I keep checking, and I'm like, why am I doing it? And I'm, like, aware of it in this weird meta level, and I'm like, so what I'm having to do right now, we're in this, the middle of this 30-day challenge where we've been making, like, digital missionary-related content 30 days straight. It's a lot. It's <laughs> um, so we're on day 20 today. Um, and so I'm challenging myself to, it's like, I am only allowed to look at the insights for, like, views and stuff 
twice a day. Once in the morning and once at night. I'm not allowed to get fixated because then it, it, it gets to this weird space of like validation from the views and it's like, no, no. My worth is in the fact that I'm a son of God, not in how many people view this video. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 that's a big one I have to remind myself of. Even though I've been doing this for going on two years, I still grapple with that one. And so, <coughs> last but not least, this is a, a tough one to end with. Yeah, but that's, that's easy. Yeah, so that's easy, easy, right? Yeah. <laughs> so be vulnerable and accountable. Woo, mercy. So as I, as I pointed out in my headings, I was like, yes, that's a lot. I, I, I realize that's a big ask. Um, so vulnerability means opening up about the things that you're sensitive to. It will more than likely be either awkward Face palm worthy, painful, or shameful. It's probably going to fall in one of those four camps, especially when it's something very close to home. Mm -hmm. Things that usually, you know, elicit this response are broken relationships, some sort of past trauma, abuse, like things in that region, really visceral experiences that you have in life. Um, but being vulnerable with God's prompting. Not being vulnerable just to get views. Like, do not, please do not do that. Because if you're just like airing all the laundry, like, you're gonna create chaos in your friend group and your families if you're like, why would you share that? It's like, because God told me to. It's like, did he? Or did you just want the views? Like, did you want to stir the pot? So, with God's prompting, like, kind of investigate with him. Lord, what are you leading me to open up that I've kind of kept as a hidden part of my journey that you know can be a benefit to others who are navigating that same liminal space? Um, it can be really inspiring for somebody who is struggling with the same thing. And a lot of times in church, we have lots of taboos. But if we like just isolate them and silence them, we're not going to be able to bring them together with God and reason together and get past those addictions. They're just gonna, if anything, fester and have more of a chokehold on us. So, with vulnerability, kind of hand in hand goes accountability. So, you have to hold yourself accountable with, I don't know what that accent just was. That was a weird, I'm like, accountable. Um, <coughs> so, that being said, hold yourself accountable with how vulnerable you are. You don't have to share your social security number to get a life. Like, don't just like go out there like, and here is the time when I was a child that moved and it's like, whoa, like, it's like that meme where it's like no one, absolutely no one, and then it's just like, like the most recent example I can think of this is kind of like how Jada Pinkett Smith uh, kind of was just airing like so much stuff, and you're like, what is happening in the Smith house? Oh gosh, nobody, but no, keep it, keep it. Mm -hmm. Keep it to yourself. Um, right and it's like, whoa, so yeah, inviting God um, into the spaces of vulnerability and accountability. So that is, everybody got our seven habits written down? Mm -hmm. All right. So now we are going to move into the content breakdown. That's my dramatic trailer voice. <laughs> so hopefully the volume works on here. I didn't get to test it before, but on the next slide, it's going to be a different um, piece of content I made. So. I just want you to kind of listen to it and just take it in, and then we're going to talk about how you react to it. So, here we go. Jesus is a chicken, and that's a good thing. As Christ journeys toward Jerusalem, he encounters holy and worldly opposition. The religious establishment is furious at his apparent disregard for the law, and King Herod is threatened by Jesus' influence and messianic character. Simply put, the powers that be don't want Jesus to be in Jerusalem. Christ laments, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I long to gather your children together, as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you are not willing. Today, Jerusalem isn't just a city, it's your heart. Standing opposed to Jesus' entry makes it impossible for his love to come and flow in us. That's why. So this is another loop one that if you play it, it goes back to the beginning. This is really embarrassing. I'm literally wearing the same shirt, so, you know, whatever it is. It's a good shirt, okay? Um, but, um, so I want to ask you 
uh, some questions like what jumped out to you as you were hearing that in real time? The Jesus is a chicken part. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How, how did that make, I saw some strong reactions over here. It was like, us that were Spanish, when, when, let's say we close a concert like that, it brings a lot of attention because people want to know, how, how are you going to say that Jesus is like a chicken? You know, when he's the creator, he's the one that made us, why are you going to call him a chicken? And, and that brings a lot. So, so like, you know the next step. I'm, I'm curious, like, what context are you hearing the word chicken in? Like, are you ascribing? Yeah. So you're hearing scared. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're hearing as well? Mm -hmm. So Yeah, that's how we say it in Spanish. So it's yeah. you know, in English too, yeah, you call someone chicken, yeah, yeah. So the interesting thing about this one was when I posted it, that happened with somebody else who was Christian and they got like extremely offended. Oh Lord. They were like they were like, My God of the angel army is doesn't have a chicken. And I was like oh. And then but you saw as I was like going, yeah, well, it was like, it became very clear to me. It's like, you were so triggered by that initial statement. You weren't listening to how I, because I, I basically walk it back. And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm standing on foreign ground. He's a chicken because he called himself a chicken. He wants to, but not in the way that you culturally are thinking of. So we came to like, you're going to have engagements like that too, where people like, especially if you use like these hook openers, they're very jarring and no, I must defend the Lord. And he's like, Psh. Hmm. He's like, okay. Uh, he's like, oh, must you? Interesting. Cool. Um, but eventually we did, we were able to kind of like come and reason together. And they were like, oh, okay. I get <coughs> what you were saying, but I was just so, I feel, well, like, they, it was interesting when they come and they were like, I felt filled with this obligation to go to bat for the Lord. Yeah. And I was just like, ooh, how often like do do we catch ourselves in situations where it's like, I must defend his honor. And it's like, okay, this is a, <laughs> like the eighteenth century, like what's the, the duel with Hamilton? Uh -huh. I don't know. So I'll kind of go on to this next one. So heathen. So that was kind of like what this person was like, they're like, this is heresy. What have you done? Da, 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 da. Um so do you think there there could have been any other responses? That, that piece of content generated, besides the one I just addressed. So once you, like, got, we got past the Jesus was a chicken part, and then I started unpacking it, did that, like, did it make sense? Were you active, were you still so focused on that first part that you were like? After you get the claim, like, you, you, yeah, you defend your claim, and then, Jesus is a chicken, and that's a good thing. <laughs> he, just, he just comes back like a ghost. I like, uh, I like that, though. <laughs> that's weird. That's, so we're talking know. about it, and then he he just, He's like, he's here. <laughs> His voice activated. So, um, but exactly what you were saying. So, like, I try my best to, like, I'm not going to um, make an out-of-pocket yeah. claim yeah. without being able to back it up mm -hmm. and be like, no, there's a scriptural basis for what I'm saying. You just might be understanding it through the lens of your cultural experience, but it's like, it's more objective than that. It's, I'm talking about a literal chicken. Like, that's <laughs> what I'm talking and about. Also, it's a, like, a different way to, um, like, um, cancel people now is cancel people mm. now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they'll find a reason to argue with anybody. Uh -huh. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's easier almost to like be mad than mm -hmm. happy. <laughs> it's like I'm gonna find everything that's wrong with what you just did, then be like, oh, a fellow Christian who's trying to engage people with, like, you know, talking. bringing negativity where positivity should be. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So, two different forms of the same idea. You can have like a video, and then you can have something called a carousel, which is like. You know when you upload a bunch of pictures on Instagram at once, you can slide? Yes. Mm -hmm. You can kind of make almost like a <coughs> slideshow. And that's kind of called a carousel. So with each video I make, I also do like a written component. So my voice isn't in it. Um, but I'm going to kind of go through the slideshow so you can see if it hits you differently just reading it versus hearing me say it. So this is the first one. And I have the art that I was working on in the video in the background. So. Jesus is a chicken. What did you just say? So I'm going to go through the rest. 
so you can kind of see. scripture I'm talking about. <coughs> and then the last two. So something that you can do at the carousel um, that I didn't do in the video was having something called a call to action. CTA is how you'll hear some of the other presenters talk about it. And um, that's where it generates, like, if you have, like, a longer form, like, a Bible study that you're wanting to host, like, once a month or something, you can direct people to, like, follow um, the link in my bio to sign up for the once a month meeting we virtually have. How do you something like that. The, a call to action. The, the... The letter that is about CTA. CTA? Mm -hmm. And that stands for call to action. Okay. So mine here was like follow if you want to open the city of your heart to Jesus love. And it kind of call, circles back to what I was saying. But I didn't say that when I made the video. Mm -hmm. Was there any other difference that you noticed between just the written version and then the one you heard previously? It's, when you're looking at it yourself, it feel like you don't hear almost like my first because that statement like all of it it was a little bit of baiting yeah, and because yeah, like the, yeah. the intonation i have is like this is a chicken that's a good thing here it's just like objective you can't hear how i said it and also a lot of my transitory language is completely absent here so if you go back and listen to it i'll be like and so, like those connectors are absent. Um, so here it's, I like the connecting language. Like it, it's just naturally how you would say it, but here it's kind of like a hard so line. Yeah, here, exactly. And the cool thing about carousels is like you ideally want each slide to be able to stand alone mm -hmm. by itself, to be an independent thought. And they, they can adjust you, you know. Once you do the carousel way, instead of doing the video, when you do the video because you're not going along with the whole thing, yeah, you're gonna get a lot of a lot of people judging you, oh, why are you saying this, why are you saying that? And then when you go to the carousel that they see exactly what you were and, saying and they read And it. you can go back and like pause on like each part and kind of digest it exactly. a bit more. So um, that was just kind of an exercise in like you can do a video or you can do a carousel and they both can serve different ways. Sometimes you'll get something with a lot of views and then you make the carousel of it and it has like very little engagement. But like the engagement it does have, it's usually the it like hits the one person who's like, oh, this this got me. And you're like, okay, awesome. You like even if it's just for one, if that it really lands with that one person, it's like praise God. Um, so, a little bit about the equipment that I use. So, very bare bones still. I do not have a massive Hollywood budget to be doing things. So, I record everything that you've seen on my iPhone. I have like a gooseneck, I, it's in my backpack in the main room, so I'm gonna have to hightail it between the sessions to get it. But it's like um, just a, a holder for your phone that you can just like twist, clamp it to the table, and then just have it over my desk as I'm painting. And, um, oh, sorry, I forgot the first one. Look at me being humble. A spirit of humility is the first thing you, you need to have, um, kind of inviting God to be in that creative space before you do anything. The phone, um, my art supplies, so I had mentioned in the main session, acrylic is mainly what I use, an easel. Um, but like in this one, it was just, um, do I have it here? Ha ha, my micron pens. So just these and like some cardstock is what I will sketch on, or just my sketchbook. Um, some sort of light source. You kind of saw like how Justin Jerry rigged his uh, before our sermon was interrupted. Um, you kind of saw the clamp lights. You could do that. There are a lot of fairly inexpensive like ring light setups you can get on Amazon. Like that like range from thirty to fifty. There are more expensive ones, but 
Hey, we all got bills to pay, so you do you <laughs> on judging what you budget, need. We're on budget. <laughs> exactly. And then as for um, editing applications, I use one called Splice. Um, that's what I've gotten really comfortable with, with just lining up my audio and um, video. But there are a ton of different ones. There's some that automatically like take out when you're recording your narration. They automatically do the captions and they take out the spaces where you breathe. So that's a really nice feature. Those ones are not free. So I do it manually. Yeah. Um, but Splice is a really good one to use. And then I call this one bare bones because this is just my starting setup. And then I call this one musculature. Like once you're like, I'm in it. I got some income. I can. Then you can determine like what is best needed in order to continually like target your audience. But don't like go in thinking like I need all this expensive equipment to reach somebody. You do not because the profits. First of all, they didn't have it. So mm -hmm. you're in good company. <laughs> so that's all I had on. The, wait, let me try. Awesome. So if you didn't get a chance in the main session, like if you scan this, it's all my social. So if you ever have like a question as you're you know, making your stuff, feel free to send it. If you lose that booklet, there's a digital version of it accessible um, here as well. And then I kind of just have a, a space for any questions that pop into your mind as we were going through it. So feel free to unleash your volley of questions at me. <laughs> no, I, it wasn't a question, it was more like a like, like story, like the, the drawing of the chicken. Mm -hmm. um, it happened to me when I was a kid, like I was like five, and, and it was like under a bush, because like my great grandparents they had like farm. Mm -hmm. And I went to touch like a, like, a, like a group of chicks, and I didn't see that the chicken was there. Oh, and it attacked me and I ran like crazy. So I know how, like, the story of, of like, when he compares Jesus to, to like, it can be kids, like, I'm gonna protect my kids. Everybody thinks of the chicken, so they don't see that side. Like, they're yeah. really protective. You just the see chicken. the chicken when so, it's frozen tender ones. And believe me, I have to run and I never. <laughs> You're like, I've never messed with the chicken again. <laughs> um, so I might have missed this in your initial session. Yeah. But um, for your seven habits, you said. Um, for number four, begin with Bible and not Bible. So I have um, a little singing thing that I do at my church, and a lot of people <coughs> like wanting me to make music, mm -hmm. like professionally. Yeah. But I, I haven't really felt like the calling to do so mm -hmm. by from God. Yeah. So I just wanted to know, like, how do you discern whether you should? Or not? That's a very good question. So, um, for me, I'll, I'll kind of I'll answer it with a story about like how I came to be where I'm at today. So I, right out of college, I majored in biological illustration, but then I could not get a job in that field. And I had fallen into this delusion that if my first job post-college isn't exactly what I studied, I'm a failure. My parents did not say that. Like my family, no friends or family said that. That was just some idea that I picked up along the way. So it took a while before I applied to anything um, outside the realm of art. When I did, it was finally teaching, so I taught for five years. But at the end of it, this was like right before um, COVID, um, I was feeling like really drained and I was getting some bigger commissions, but they were cutting into like my time as a teacher. So I was like, God, like, what's the deal? Like, it, how are you gonna set me up? Enough? And so I actually, um, right before COVID hit, I went to Puerto Rico for the first time. I have a friend who, his family's from Aguadilla. So we went there, and then like while I was there, it was on spring break, I kind of just like had it, I had my Job yelling at God moment. And I was like, I don't get how like, I'm out here ready to answer the call for visual arts ministry, but you're not opening the door to that. And um, God clapped back and was like, I'm ready to build the frame, but you're the one stuck in the safety of a salary that's not even that good. And I was like, <clears throat> oh, that one hurt. That, that one hurt a lot. And so I, like, then I chewed on it, and I was like, yeah, this, I really am feeling like extremely drained in this teaching profession. I, I definitely learned lessons about doing life that I don't think I could have learned outside of being a teacher. Um, and I'm still like a visual arts teacher now. But I was like, I don't think it's this is the place God is telling me to stay. And he even entertained my, my bargaining with him. I was like, maybe, maybe you want me to be an art teacher. That's a good settlement. 
And for the last six months, I was, and that nearly killed me. <laughs> I was like, no, you, you kind of get to the point where you're just like, Jesus, like you, you let me get a preview of what what doing it my way looks like, and it's killing me. It's extremely taxing. So like, whatever you, wherever you want to take this, like you have to like. Th that was him making it markedly clear for me. And then I had to submit a statement of intent as to next school year, do I want the same position, same school, um, different position, same school, different school, different, different, do I want out, do I want to quit? And so after that trip from Puerto Rico, I came back and I had to submit my statement of intent and it was like in my box and I told them, I was like, yeah, I'm not coming back. And literally a week after that is when we all shut down because of the pandemic and I'm like, well, this seems a bit on the nose, Lord. Um, I'm not, I hope um, a pandemic does not happen again to enlighten you as to your choice. <laughs> um, but I would say just, um, yeah, I, well, I applaud you for like kind of being aware of like, they want me to do it, but I'm not a place yet where I'm feeling to do that. So honestly, just like a lot more intentional prayer about the discernment for that. And then um, is it like, is it a realm of like, oh, this is like a ministry that I feel like could be sustainable. And it's, it's the target audience that I want to engage in conversation with. Or if it's like something completely different, it's like, okay, maybe not. And just, just be like, you know, you, you can, if you want to sing, you can sing. But like, I don't have to right now. Yeah. Well, they, I've already like talked to producers and everything. I've oh. already like, and get, like given them my music yeah. and all of that. But I still don't feel like I want to do that professionally. As a side and like for ministry, of course I don't feel bonded to that's fine. And it's something that I like to do. I'm good at it, yeah. but not like for a career. And and maybe that can like continue to be a compliment that you you do on the side in addition to like whatever you know professional vocation you end up in. So yeah, just giving the God the um, space to be like enlighten me as to like what I actually like am passionate about for you. Because sometimes we don't even know like really like what excites us about serving God. <coughs> So I'm um, just asking him to like continually to make that clearer, I'd say. So what do you do day to day? Like how should you work? You work nine to five? Ah, know? the so, questions. <laughs> so what do you do? You have to there's a website and you have to put content on it? So for the so the stipend he mentioned, there it's just me posting to my handles, but posting at least it's at least once a week. I'm sharing content for on not through the uh, Florida Conference's handle, just through my independent account, but um, actively always creating content for them. But that's not my only source of income. I also um, teach at like three different places, like a true Jamaican, I have multiple streams of income. So um, I teach at um, the Orlando Museum of Art um, and two local, uh, or one local gallery and then Massachusetts College of Art and Design I do virtual lectures for. Okay. And then I have my own business doing murals and like fine art illustration that falls outside the realm of just biological illustration. So I'll show you a quick preview of that. So like here are like some of my murals. So I'm from Oviedo, which is kind of Orlando area. Uh -huh. And then, and murals are cool. Like they can be visual art ministry too because I don't try and constrain God because like half the time, like you can't hide when I'm working on these. Like they're big enough that people see it in all the ugly duckling stages and they get curious. So, oh, is it time? Oh, welcome, welcome. I guess it's time for, oh yeah, yeah, it definitely is time. So thank you all for stopping by. And like, if you think of questions, like find me this weekend and I'll be more than Into like how I actually do visual art ministry as a biological illustrator. That's just me drawing in the middle of the desert for no apparent reason, you know, as, as one does. So um, this is all about visualizing my faith and making it accessible. So whether, I'm curious, how many of you are like visual artists or like to do your art? Okay. Yes, we have quite a few. And even if you're not, there are definitely principles that are applicable to other um, means of talking about God. But the important thing is that you're doing it in an accessible way because you can have like 
such amazing like Christian content, but if somebody who like isn't a Christian doesn't feel they can engage with it, it's it's all for naught. And that's kind of why I have um, this verse, Psalm 127, 1 there, which is, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. You could tack on, unless somebody invites God to direct their painting, the painter paints in vain. So kind of the same idea. So one of the ways I do ministry is I participate in um, like art festivals. So this was over in Maitland. For, for my Orlando people who know it. Um, they had an art festival in November. So I go there with my art. And there are not a lot of people, you know, doing evangelism at an art festival. So uh, for a long time, I didn't do them because, you know, they're, they're weekend long events. And so Sabbath, like you, you would be out there. And I'm like, ooh, but I had to that fun but then I was like but all my art is literally faith-based and the priority isn't to make a profit it's to talk about him mm -hmm. so it's like if the people pay I'm like I, I try and like make it so I'm talking with them more about art and if they really want to buy something I'm like, okay but God and I have a understanding and that's just like a personal walk you know I'm sure there are some people who would be like that's a heresy so you know <laughs> But like I said, I didn't see a whole lot of people doing ministry at an art festival. So I can't, like I said up there, like don't just point out a problem of like, nobody's doing ministry here. It's like, if you have a paintbrush and you have a voice, go for it. So, hi there, come on in. So, once again, that's me. I Sometimes I'm, it's getting long enough that I, I thought about doing it live, but I was like, nah, we're not going to do that. So, like I said, biological illustration background, kind of, that's where the term biological comes from, because it's natural history, but with like a Bible point of view. So here are three other ones. Some of them are in the booklet. Well, I don't think one of them is. I forgot which one went in. So I'm just curious. I want to I test your biblical deciphering. Can anybody venture a guess as to like what Bible accounts match with what painting? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. Isn't the middle one uh, when Jesus is being tried to like yeah. mm -hmm. So that one's called Roosting and Shame. It's all about mm -hmm. like Peter's shame. A lot of these like there's an underlying attribute that I'm speaking to. So it's shame for that one with Peter and the rooster. Mm -hmm. The ones on the the sides are a bit more abstract. This one, especially when I show this at festivals, people are like, "You have a devil worshiper." <laughs> but it's like the, it's something completely the other side of the room. Is it like Joseph? With this one? Yes. Not Joseph. I'll give you a hint. This one was. Oh yeah, he's he's just been buzzing around. <laughs> we'll keep a we'll keep a weary eye on. That there were two. The other one went away. I don't know where. So we oh, uh, said the same Oh, okay. We're just gonna <laughs> be gone. <laughs> so I'll give you a hint with this one. Um, temple. Are those the sacrifices that people would like do for? So these are all the different animals that were used in the system of sacrifice. So. Goats, lambs, pigeons, and, or sorry, doves, and it's hard to see because it's near got cut off, but calves. So that one, and then that one was kind of a piece dealing with how the sacrificial system, as they did it, is no longer necessary. Why? Jesus. There's your sermon for that. Um, and then how about the right side? Yeah. Um, is it Yes. What elements of Elijah do you see? Uh, I see the reason that Elijah was stranded during the drought. Well, not stranded, but again, on the run. Yeah. <laughs> and God had to bring him through the raven. And then I think the path is like the. Is it when they had to. When they did the. The face off? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then there's one more animal. Anyone know what part of Elijah's story that one has? The chariot? Yep. So, cherry of fire, don't have the song going, but yeah. So, all of these, um, like I said, they're like fluorescent. So, the cool thing is, like, when I'm um, at an art festival at night and paint with these, I have black lights. So, I turn that on, and they 
all like glow. So people, that really draws people in to like check them out. And then that leads to them being like, oh, that's like a really well drawn rooster, but like I don't get like what's happening. And then we can have, it just, it's a safe space that they can just like question without, you know, feeling kind of like belittled, like it can happen at Sabbath school. Like um, something that we had in our young adult Sabbath school, Spring Meadows, we've tried to intentionally take out verbiage of like, well, we all know the story of Moses because, like, if you say that and then it's somebody's first time ever at church, like, they feel like, oh, I'm an idiot for not knowing about Moses, so I guess I just won't open my mouth and participate in the discussion. So trying to make it more accessible, that's a big part of content creation. So kind of one of the big guideposts for, like, how I'm creating, this is another quote from the same author that I mentioned in the general session, Edwin Raphael McManus. There's an old adage that the devil is in the details, but the artisan understands that when life is a work of art, when we value our craft, when we embrace the elegance of workmanship, it's in the details that we experience the divine. This is why um, it's not just about the final image that I make that allows ministry to happen. It's like personal for like when I'm like mixing all the paint, then like sometimes when I have to make a custom color, I'm using colors that I wouldn't even think of to make the exact shade I need. And I'm like, whoa, that's an object lesson about God using things that I don't think are worthy to make something worthy. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm having church here. <laughs> hey, what's happening? So um, kind of inviting God to be part of like all of your content creation, not just the final product. So what we're going to do in our time together, uh, I'm a former teacher, so I have to have a table of contents and lesson plan. Um, we're going to go over the seven habits of highly creative digital missionaries. I'm going to refer to those as CDMs from here on out. We're going to take a look at a different uh, finished piece of content that I made in two different forms. We're going to look at a video and then something called a carousel, which is basically like a slideshow that you can make on Instagram. Um, we're going to reverse engineer it and I'm going to be asking for like your opinions, your reactions, how you might think my intended audience would have reacted. I'll go a little bit into like the equipment, apps, and like what my studio setup looks like. I do not have a fancy multi-million dollar studio. I have a bedroom. That is my studio, full disclosure. So, um, and then I'll answer some questions, and if we have any extra time, we can kind of um, start to figure out what creating a piece of content together would look like. So, the seven habits of creative visual missionaries. So this is the studio. This is like literally my bedroom floor. This is the carpet I'm desperately trying not to get paint on. It's too late. Um, but yeah, we're just going to kind of go over that. So have any of you heard of a book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People? So this is kind of like a riff off of that. And it's a great book. Um, like none of the habits are bad, but we're going to put like a little twists and modification for a digital missionary city. So if you have those like little booklets, like the ones with my art in them, open up to that back page where there's an itemized list of seven. And let me see if I have paper. They did not give me paper. Yeah, 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 for sure. So, while they're retrieving theirs, we will, we will talk at length about habit one. <laughs> so, habit number one is simple, but very hard for us to practice, it is be still. So, it seems like really counterintuitive to tell people who want to create content to be still, because you're like, I gotta create the content, I gotta edit it, I gotta blah, 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 all these fun things, I gotta post it to four different platforms. Um, and we kind of like live in a society that fosters unnaturally so this sense of urgency, this, the grind, the hustle to, like, I gotta do me. Um, and sometimes it's good to have that like adrenaline rush driving you. Like uh, for instance, like when I was at UF, there were many a time when I practiced um, something I like to call productive procrastination. I don't know if any of you know what, this is basically like when you make a list of like 20 things you need to do for the day, but you start at item 20 and work your way back with like the smallest thing, like it can be like get out of bed. And you're like, yes, 
I did it. I have succeeded. But like the first thing was like pay your bills. And you're like, mm -hmm. Not yet, Lord. <laughs> Not yet. Um, so when I practice that, like it can, you know, be good for. Or there's like a deadline. Like you, you know, you had a month to do this assignment. But then the night before, hard cuts you. And so that adrenaline kicks in. And you're like, I'm gonna. This is gonna be the best. 500 words, I say they are. So 500 words is nothing. Trust me, it gets worse. Um, and it can be good to kind of power you through to meet that deadline. But when you're about God's work, operating from a, a place of like adrenaline rush, not the, the best place to operate from because it's not sustainable in the long run. So um, instead of like immediately getting busy, and being like, I need to work and create content, like, take the time to be still and like, know God. Not for the benefit of creating content, but just to know God for the sake of knowing Him. Like, full stop. So, a great biblical example of somebody not being still is Mary and Martha in Scripture. Does anybody, who can give me a quick recap about Mary and Martha? Jesus and his disciples that came to have like a lunch or they came to have like a lunch and you know chill and I think it was Mary who was running around. Okay, it was okay. It was Martha who was running around and like turning to them. She was like, Oh, we need to get this time, we need to get that time, we need to get that for them. And then Mary was just kind of there. She was like just sitting with Jesus and like talking to him and like catching up, you know, basically. And she's just like, hi, how are you doing? Like scriptures and stuff like that, listening to his teaching. And then Martha came in and she's just like, don't you really have work to do? Why aren't you helping me? Why are you sitting here? And uh, Mary, was Mary, right? Mary was like, um, I'm here. I'm list. I'm spending time with Jesus. That's what I'm doing. Yeah, and Jesus even goes a step further, and he says something directly to Martha when she, like, is a, like I said, both my parents are Jamaican, so the, something of what that conversation would have looked like is this. Mary, I want you to do it there. And then it would have been like, he's a father, may I, may I learn from she has, she has chores in the right thing. That's what it would be like. Yes, my papa is atrocious, but, you know, that's what it is. So, basically, Jesus kind of, like, gently chides her, but he's like, She's doing the right thing. She's taking the time to be still, like while you're like driving yourself crazy. But are you gaining life by like let the dishes be dirty for a minute more and take the time to know who I am? Let the content, like the pressure to post something by 12 noon, put it aside. Don't worry about the content. Worry about the creator. Mm -hmm. So habit number two. So you can put this next to number two in the booklet is going to be, and you can write in these, so like, please, please write um, in this book if you have. It is imitate, don't emulate. So, can anybody tell me like the difference between those two words, imitate and emulate? Emulate is like creating something that's almost identical to something else, and imitating would be like taking something you like from that and making it your own. Very good. So when you imitate something, you're you're kind of looking at somebody who's a little bit further along, and you're like, okay, I want to practice like figure drawing, like, let's see, which artist I'm going to choose? Van Gogh. That'd be painting more. Um, to paint more expressively like him. But I know at the end of the day, my painting is going to look a little bit different than his. Like, I want to paint in a different way. Emulation is... I'm going to do exactly what they're doing, but I'm going to do better. It's a, it's, there's like this angsty edge to it that's not good at all. So it's great to have like inspiration from other content creators um, working in like the same vein or style that you kind of like feel comfortable with and that you want to go towards. But when you kind of veer into the realm of like comparison, of like forcing yourself to adopt their voice, um, that's when it kind of becomes unnatural. And it's not sustainable because you're trying to talk in somebody else's voice, but you're realizing at the same time that doesn't sound like me. And you're, then you have like an existential crisis of like, what am I about? And you're like, well, calm down. 